Now, the question that we need to consider is why truthfulness? Why kindness? Why are they part of... And please note, he's not coming at this from a moral point of view. He's not saying you're a bad person because you lie. He's saying that somehow, in some way or another, your lies and your unkind speech is contributing to your suffering. That your lies and your, or yours, our lies and our lies <laughs> contribute to our suffering. And if you think about it a little bit, and, and this takes, this is why my class is 12 weeks long, but if you, if you think about it and analyze those lies where you catch yourself, where we catch ourselves, they're self-serving. Okay? They are, generally they fall into one of two categories. Either <clears throat> I'm trying to protect myself from something out there that I think will hurt me in some way. And this lie is a protection for me from that which is out there. Have you got your homework done? Almost. <laughs> By the way, that means no. <laughs> okay. um, but you're trying to protect yourself. Self. You know, it, it's self-oriented stuff. Or the second kind of a lie is where you're trying to make yourself look good in the eyes of others. Um, I can tell you stories about my football career in high school. I, in fact, have many stories about my football career in high school. The truth is, I didn't play football in high school. <laughs> When I meet somebody, and I say, Hi, my name is Steve Harrison. And the person shakes my hand and gives me his name. If you were to ask me three seconds later what that person's name was, I'd probably forget. Not that I didn't hear it, but that I'm thinking about, did I come across correctly? Is he thinking that I'm, you know, Okay, uh, did, I, did I shake hands well like my mother taught me to? Uh, I, I have so many different things going on. Or perhaps I'm shaking hands with you, but looking at a beautiful woman standing next to you and not paying any attention. <laughs> that there are many different things that go on that keep us from being aware. That so much of the time, like this evening when you all were coming in, and some of you I know, and some of you I don't know, and whatever. And I, I was happy to see old friends and eager to see new people and so on. And I was just a jumble. I was trying, really, to look over my notes as to what I was going to say. Nothing effective was going on. I'm not sure I remember everybody. I'm sure I don't remember everybody I met. And I know I didn't look over my notes in any effective way, even though my eyes passed over the words, which I wrote yesterday. I wasn't mindful. <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, it's so great to have it in this room. Fifteen years ago, I invited a Buddhist monk who had been a Branson parent, interestingly enough. But he was a Buddhist monk, and I said, would you come and talk to the parents? And he said, sure, and he did. And the room was not as full as it is tonight. It was about half full. There were probably, I don't know, 30, 40, the 40 people here. He knew nobody. And they all came in and sat down, and I got up, just uh, uh, as he did, and introduced him. And he came out, and he sat in the chair. He had his Buddhist monk robes on. He sat down. I'll recreate this. <laughs> and he sat down. And he adjusted his robes. And then he took you a thermos, tea. I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> and he took maybe two minutes, which is an extraordinarily long time, 
to sit down and have a drink and get started. It took two minutes. It was absolutely silent in the room. And then he said, thank you for inviting me this evening, Steve, and thank you all for coming. Would you all introduce yourselves? And the parents went around, and each one said their names. And then the monk spoke for about 20 minutes. <laughs> he knew much more than I and spoke much less. <laughs> he spoke for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and then he said, do you have any questions? <clears throat> Somebody raised his hand. And he said, yes, Fred? <laughs> and he answered Fred's question. He said, yes, Bonnie? He knew everyone's name. And it was pretty darn impressive. Yes. People were like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him, I asked him afterwards, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? And he said to me, when they were speaking, I was just listening. That was, that was all he said. But that was the key. There was nothing else going on for him but listening. He wasn't thinking about what he was going to say. He wasn't thinking about how they were viewing him. He was totally aware or mindful of that one thing. It was, it was, it was beautiful and it was powerful. And it taught me more than any words that I could give of what mindfulness practice is really about. That we lead our lives with so many different things going on at once. You know, in your heads right now, there are probably two or three different things going on at once. When I'm teaching the students, I know that even when they're listening to me, that they are aware of what time it is, and how much time is left in the period, and whether or not the girl or boy next to them likes them or not, and whether they have a physics test coming up soon that is much more scary than anything Mr. Hendricks, and all of, all of this, no, I'm serious, all of this is going on at once, at different levels of our consciousness that prevent us from being totally in the moment. We're afraid of the future. We're waiting for that future. We're, we're dreading, we're not dreading, we're, we are sorry for what happened in the past or angry for what happened in the past and all of those.